Well, welcome. Peace, love, and joy to you and your family. I'm so happy you decided to join us today on So Says the Lord with Sherry Hills Ministries, where we're learning, living, and loving. So let's dive right into the refreshing living waters of the Word of God. Today we will continue to look at the Sermon on the Mount. And we will look at what Jesus taught about prayer and fasting. Our series purpose is to read the words of Christ and to Selah, or ponder the meaning and message. Our series scriptural focus is found in Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. The scripture I will look at today will be Matthew 6, 5 to 18. And if you are going to join us for Bible study, you would also read Mark 11, 20 to 26. So every series that we do, we have two separate components, the Bible teaching followed by the Bible study. So if you are someone that wants to dive deeper into the Word of God, join us for Bible study. Again, read you would read Mark 11, 20 to 26. Visit my website, www.sherryhealthministries.org. There you will find information about how to participate in the Bible study. While you are there, if this ministry is being a blessing in your life, please consider sowing a seed to help us to continue to advance the Word of God. So an overview. Today we will look at what Jesus taught about prayer and fasting. As we read the red letter words of Christ, take note that he sheds light on genuine prayer and fasting in contrast to hypocritical prayer and fasting. Let's dive right into this teaching right after a brief message. Welcome back. Let's dive right in. So Matthew 6, 5 to 18. Now I'll be looking at the King James Version. Any version you have is fine. If it's not King James, it may read a bit differently though. So Matthew 6, 5. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to stand for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. So, just because someone prays, so Jesus is talking about those people that pray, and they want to be heard, so apparently they are known as people who, who can pray well. So. They're comfortable, they're confident, and they're praying. I'm sure they were very eloquent. We know that there are some people that say prayers that are, you know, they're very meaningful, but they're also very beautiful, the way that they, they say the prayers. And so some people, lots of people that pray, <clears throat> and it has an, uh, a very um, eloquent sound to it, they are sincere, but some are not. So just because someone prays and even prays with eloquence, it does not mean necessarily that their prayers are sincere or even that they genuinely know God. So real Christians, we know that there are people that for whatever reason, which really when you think about it, it doesn't make sense, but they want to um, say that they are Christian or be known as a Christian, but they really don't have a heart for God and you know that defeats the purpose because being a Christian is all about a relationship with God so why anyone would decide to pretend with something like Chris being a Christian doesn't make sense but we know that it happens because the Bible talks about it quite a bit and so just because someone can pray and that doesn't mean that we're supposed to you know start trying to judge or are they sincere or not 
Jesus knows. God knows if someone is is sincere, but it's not up to us to try to, you know, uh, see if someone is sincere or not. That's not the point of it. The point of it is Jesus is saying, be sincere because God knows whether we are sincere or not. And he's saying, if you're praying just for show, he said, well, that's your reward. You want it to be seen and heard of man? Okay, so so you got that. And that's what he's saying. Verse 6. But thou, when thou prayest. So he is saying, these are what the hypocrites do. Excuse me. Those who say that they are followers of God, but they really are not. But he is now saying, but you. So he's talking to the ones who are true followers. He says, but thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to the Father, pray to thy Father, which is in secret, and thy Father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. So, Romans 12, 12 tells us to be continuing instant in prayer. So we know that we should be able to pray in an instant, if needed. But as a practice, and in our Christian walk, we should engage in private personal prayer also to the Lord the fruit of a the fruit of a private prayer life is public blessedness so we should be able to pray in an instant why because prayer has power you know if, if something happens uh, and there's some type of an emergency People, you know, will die down 911. That's the go to. If there's an emergency, something happened, help is needed, 911. For a Christian, if something happens, help is needed, we must address the situation, but we also must be instant in prayer. That means that that is our. So, so before uh, in another teaching, I talked about a knee jerk reaction that a lot of times the world has this knee jerk reaction where it's a tit for tat thing. So if this happens, if you do something to me, well, tit for tat, I'm going to do something to you in return. But for Christians, our knee jerk reaction should be instant in prayer. That is what we our knee jerk is. Something happens instant in prayer. We need to be able to do that, to go to God. When things are good, when things are bad, when things are steady, when things are chaotic, just pray as a practice. We should always um, be uh, praying. So that means we are constantly connected to um, the source of our strength, which is the Lord. We're always connected to Him. And so how do we communicate with God? We communicate with him through prayer. And so we're always in conversation and communication with God. Always. So we should be able to be instant in prayer. But we should also have a prayer, um, a, a time of prayer where we are purposely, you know, just making sure that we seek God, that we we go into our prayer closet. That means just our own personal, private time with God. We don't need to blow a trumpet and say, you know, um, I'm going to go pray now. Um, you know, no, we don't need to tell everybody. We don't need to say, I pray at, at, at 6 o'clock, at um, 9 o'clock, at 12 o'clock. We don't need to do that. We just need to know that we are praying to God, that we are connected to him, that we have a secret time, a, a set of time, a set, um, a set aside time in our daily walk with God where we seek him in an intimate way. And that's what that's talking about. So we should be instant in prayer, like the Bible tells us, but we also should have um, deliberate prayer. So instant in prayer is prayer in the moment. You know, but deliberate prayer is, you know, this is planned. God, I want to come and talk to you because you're my father, because I love you, because I need you, because I'm connected to you, because you're so good to me. God, I want to talk to you. And so we make sure that we talk to him. And so, and then verse seven, 
But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. So talk to God like he is your father. When you go to your earthly father or mother, <coughs> excuse me, you don't have some type of uh, script that you have written out. Uh, oh, dear mother, um, I need, you know, I beseech thee, dear mother, or, or anything. You know, you just talk in a normal way. You don't, you know, if you if you want something from your mother or father, you know, uh, let's, let's, let's just say a, um, a cup of glass of water. Um, oh, dear mother, I need, um, I would like a glass of water. Oh, water, dear mother, you know, I, you know, just things like that. So God is saying, don't be silly with me. You know, just, just talk to God. Don't, don't feel like you need to put on some show and um, have to, uh, you know, do all of these things. Just be dramatic. Oh, dear Lord. And just talk to him. He's your father. He loves you. He wants to have a, a close, intimate, personal um, relationship with you where it's just normal. Some people make interacting with God an ordeal. But for a Christian, it should just be natural. We just talk to him. He's just our father. Yes, we honor him. Yes, we reverence him. Yes, we recognize who he is. That he is the creator of everything that's created. That he is, you know, the he is sovereign. He is omnipotent. He is omniscient. He is omnipresent. He is all of these grand and wonderful things but he also wants us to be able to come to him uh comfortably knowing that um yes you, you can talk to me you're welcome to talk to me and so we always reverence him but it's not a reverence that keeps us at um an arm's length it's a reverence that lets us know he's holy He's a holy God, and I, you know, I've got to reverence and honor Him, but it's not to be at arm's length. Some people actually are like that, and that's why sometimes when you, as a Christian, when you know God and you're saying that you have a conversation with Him, you can talk to Him, you know, you walk with Him, you know, He He's with you at all times, and some people can look at you like you're actually insane and think, "What do you mean you you talk to God?" Yes, I can talk to God. He has a relationship with me so that I can talk to him. His word tells me to talk to him. Some people actually think that there's something wrong with you if you think that you can talk to God. But that we know as Christians that the Bible tells us that we can talk to him, that he's our father, and we are supposed to have a close, intimate relationship with him. He does not hold us off at hand's length and say, you know, you need to... um go through 10 other people in order to communicate with me. No, we can talk to him directly for ourselves. And so, um, verse 8. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. So, God knows all things. He is, and like I already said, he's omniscient. That means he knows everything he knows what we need even before we ask him we have to believe these things they can't just be something that we read and oh you know i believe it intellectually no you have to believe it uh factually it, it's not just a a thing where it's intellectual knowledge it's like you know what this is true this is he really does know everything he really he really pays that close attention to me that he knows what I need, even before I know I need it. He knows that I need whatever it is that I may need. And so, let's keep reading. Um, verse 9. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. So Jesus, he is giving us a prayer pattern here. He's giving us a prayer pattern. And this prayer pattern consists of prayer points. He's saying, when you pray, hit on these things. You hit on these things, 
and you're praying a complete prayer. You're praying, you're praying an effective, fervent, fervent prayer. He's saying, hit on these prayer points when you pray. And then it says, say this, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So this is um, God's kingdom is righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. This is what we want to come or manifest in our lives and in the body of believers. So we pray. When we pray, this is what it's talking about. He's giving us prayer points to hit on. Now, it's very um, perfectly fine to just pray this prayer just as it is written. There is nothing wrong with doing that. But when you go deeper into it, he's saying, well... These are points also. So you could take these points and apply them specifically to whatever needs you may have. Whatever needs you may have, thy kingdom come. So what is in the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is where his rule and his will prevails. And so since I know that God's will for me is good and not evil, that he wants only good things for to happen to me and nothing bad he wants me to prosper he wants me to um, have good health he wants my needs to be met so I know that this is his will and so when I'm praying as far as I, that kingdom come I'm praying for his will in my life what is your will if you're sick in your body is that the will of God it isn't his will is not for you to be sick and so you want his will, whatever is in his kingdom, to come and manifest in your life, in your body, in the lives of your uh, children, your, your husband, your wife, your family members. You want his will to be done. The next prayer point is give us this day our daily bread. God is concerned about us every day. He's concerned about us every day. Jehovah Jireh is one of God's names that tells us that he is our provider. He will provide for our daily needs, whatever we need day to day. He's watching over us. He wants you to have provision today, tomorrow, and every day that he allows his life-giving breath to flow through you. He wants your needs to be met. You know, some people feel unworthy of their needs being met. They feel um, afraid in life. If, if something happens, fear grips them. But we as children of God, we know that sometimes in life, we're not going to have all of the things that we may need or want at that specific time. Sometimes life... Uh, uh, um, a snapshot in our lives. We don't have everything we want. We, we, we may not be um, living our lives just as we want. We may not have all of the things just as we want. But when you are in Christ, you learn to be content like Paul. Be content whatever, whatever situation you find yourself in as long as you know that you are following the Lord. Don't worry. Sometimes people get so caught up in appearances and how things are supposed to look and how things are supposed to be going. Sometimes in life as a Christian, our lives are not going like we want it to go. Um, you know, and sometimes, you know, even other Christians can look at you and think, oh, well, why is it, you know, you're, you're a Christian. Why? Why are you struggling financially then? Or why, why are you sick? If you're a Christian, what, we're, we're people. We're people and we're, we live in an imperfect world. And we're subject to the things that happen, that can happen to, hum, to a human being. Does that mean that God is not active? No. It doesn't mean that he is not active in our lives. And so, even though it may not be his will at that time, but he can still work it out for our good. That's what the Bible tells us. And so... If his will has not yet manifested and you're still dealing with a sickness or, or some situation that's not right, but you know you're in God, then just know that there is another lesson.
that he is allowing you to um to to learn see everything in God there's a lesson he's not he's not putting any sickness on you but he will let you let good come from that situation somehow okay so just trust him but but keep believing for his will because that's what he wants us to believe for that's what he wants to um happen and to manifest for us in our lives and so believe for his will and there's so much that i would like to say on these different points but you know of course i have a limited amount of time and so i want to get through it but if you can just remember his will for you is good and not evil he doesn't want anything bad to happen to you so keep believing for the good hold on to him trust in him and know that sometimes as human beings we don't have the ideal everything right then but be content as long as you know that you're holding on to God just keep on holding on to God just keep on living for God and he'll keep on working in your life and so the next point um then he says and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors these are prayer points prayer points the church is under grace and not the law but Christ still instructs us to request forgiveness of sin and to forgive others. And so you may have heard people say that under grace, you know, there's not even any real need to, to repent. But the Bible tells us to forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Um, it tells us it tells us in, um, in other scriptures to repent for things and that and. And so when something has occurred, you are to repent. You repent for what you've done um, and you forgive. So you forgive and you repent. If you have done something yourself, you repent if you know that it is, you know, it's something that is not within the will of God. But you also forgive others. God does not want us holding on to grudges and, and being angry. Anger. And and um, when you hold on to it, it's doing something to you. It is, it's corroding you in some way. Um, it's not working anything good. When you hold on to the anger, it's affecting you more than, than whoever you're holding that anger against. They don't even, you know, they might know that you're angry and not care. Or maybe they do care, but but the feeling and the um, act of holding on to anger is something that is not working anything good within you in any way. And so learn to forgive. God forgave us. He forgave us when we weren't even, you know, um, he, he decided to come to this earth and even, you know, allow himself to be, you know, really murdered by man, his own creation. Can you imagine that? I mean, he let his own creation murder him so that he could, you know, work something to our benefit so that we could be saved. And so, um, who are we not to forgive others? Forgive. Forgive. And um, whatever that person, you know, does, then they're accountable to God. But we're accountable to God. And so let your heart and mind be right. And know that the Lord will fight your battles. He will. He see. He doesn't want you to just say, oh, this is, someone did this horrible thing or this wrong to me or to my loved one. Let it go. It doesn't matter. It's, that's not what forgiveness is about. Forgiveness is about it doesn't matter. It's not about that. It does matter. But God wants us to give it to him. He can handle the matter so much better than we can. But if we hold on to that anger within ourselves, it's not going to work anything good in us. And so we need to let it go and learn to forgive. And then um, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So under grace, God will forgive us when we fall. We can though, we can wander into sin. But here Christ instructs us to pray that God holds us back from wandering 
into temptation or sin because even though we can be forgiven for sin sin is still evil and it can harm us or even in our lives and so he's telling us to pray in other words God tether me to righteousness tether us to righteousness so we can't wander so we can't wander into a pit so we can't wander into a trap so we can't wander. See, you see, you can put out cheese for a mouse or something. And that mouse might think that she, that cheese looks pretty good. <laughs> and so he goes and or the mouse goes and wanders over to it. But it's a trap. That's what sin is. It's a trap. Even though it might seem good, it might seem desirable, it might seem even something like you need. But sin is a trap. And so we want Christ to tether us to righteousness uh, so that we will be safe. And um, and as we wrap up, uh, so just so then it then okay, and and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So so he said, Amen. So that's the end of the prayer points that he gave us. So as we wrap up this prayer, Christ lets us know why God has the power to answer such a powerful prayer. Why? For thine is. This is why. For thine is the kingdom. The kingdom of our dwelling as children of God is the kingdom of God. And it belongs to God. Every provision we need to be whole, to have shalom in every way is in his kingdom the power the ability to make it happen god is omnipotent which i said before all power belongs to him and he is able to do it whatever he has promised to do in his word he is able to do it doesn't matter you know if someone's trying to stop it doesn't matter god is able and then it says the glory the glory of God is his very essence and being of wonder, majesty, power, beauty, all glory or praise and recognition of greatness is due to God alone because he is God. Because he is God. He's sovereign. He's almighty. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent, omniscient. He has no equal. He has no equal. He has no real opponent. There's no true opponent to God. He is unequal and unmatched. He is the creator of all creation. And then the prayer ends, amen. The prayer point ends with him telling us to say, say amen. Amen, so be it. Let it be done, God. Let your will be done. Amen, so be it. Verse 14 to 18. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad cat.